Hi everyone, my name is Isabel Cook and I'm in the third year of my PhD at the University of Sheffield. Um, and my thesis is focused on developing a new method for assessing the vulnerability of the historic landscape to climate change. So as I'm sure uh, most people in this session are aware, archaeology is threatened by climate change um, in ways such as coastal erosion, sea level rise and flooding, increased biological attack and uh, desiccation. But my research is focusing on the impact of climate change on the historic landscape um, and in particular on the character of the historic landscape. So just for those of you who might not be aware, the historic landscape um, is thought to be an artefact of past land use, uh, social structures, economic processes and political decisions. So it's not a single thing necessarily, but rather a summation of physical components such as transport routes, field boundaries, urban development pattern and vegetation type. So the historic landscape is dynamic and uh, proponents of the concept stress that there's no elements or time periods that are more valuable or more important uh, than any other. So focusing on the historic landscape rather than on archaeological sites as individual discrete entities makes sure that archaeological features are considered within their context and it also addresses things like the visual character of the landscape and how it's perceived, not just the archaeological information held within it. So I've chosen this image, which is a panorama that I took in the Dacini Valley in Wales um, as an example of the historic landscape. So this here is a recently abandoned shepherd's hut so much of the historic and archaeological importance of this building is not limited to the building itself, but it can be found in the way that it relates to post-medieval and medieval sheepfolds in the surrounding hills and to continuing traditional land use practices and lifeways in the area. Furthermore, the presence of this structure within the landscape influences the visual and historic character of the landscape. A loss of this structure due to climate change or to any other threat would markedly change the historic agricultural character of the immediate vicinity and therefore the tangible connection between those living and working in the landscape today and their local heritage. So as well as impacting individual sites, as I've mentioned, climate change will, and in some cases already is, um, have an impact on historic landscapes and the historic character of landscapes. So for instance, increasing temperature and um, instances of drought might increase the frequency of forest fires um, and cause them to happen in areas where there haven't been forest fires um, in a very long time, if ever. Severe flooding can also impact the historic landscape, as well as the properties within it, removing people from their homes and preventing the continuation of their livelihood or traditional life practices. These occurrences can change the relationship between people and their landscape and the way that they might perceive it, as well as changing the physical elements within the landscape. However, there is a scale mismatch in the way that climate change occurs and affects heritage, and the way it can often be managed. So, a scale mismatch is where the scale of a phenomenon or issue isn't aligned with the scale of the system that's been designed to manage or react to it. So this graphic um, I've just created to demonstrate this. So here these coloured blocks represent a system such as a river catchment or an ecosystem. There's a clear mismatch here in the geographical area of the systems and the black grids over it which represent the scale of management, whether that's national and local jurisdictional boundaries or different levels of policy implementation. So although the management system has been divided to work at more local levels, it still doesn't fit with the scale of the phenomenon or issue that it's trying to address because issues like climate change and, nat and natural systems are generally cross-border and don't fit into modern political boundaries. So this can limit the effectiveness of potential management approaches because each jurisdiction only has control over a small kind of fragmented section of the wider issue. So how is this relevant to archaeology and historic landscapes? The systems of archaeological management and research often operate on very different spatial scales to the processes that threaten archaeology, such as climate change, but also to the archaeology itself. 
So this just demonstrates uh, the range of different scales that are involved. I obviously haven't included climate change because that is kind of all-encompassing, although it does operate at the impact of climate change can operate at different temporal and spatial scales. So often, archaeological sites um, can be recorded and, and assessed by regional archaeological authorities, as demonstrated in the top figure. This approach can be fragmented and might cause the connections between sites um, to be uh, overlooked. Alternatively, research might assess the vulnerability or exposure of all registered sites in a landscape or even in a whole country, as demonstrated in the second figure. However, by only focusing on sites as discrete entities, it both overlooks the archaeological and historical importance of living elements within the landscape and obscures the variation in historic character across the landscape. So, my overall uh, aim of my PhD is to develop a framework to assess, to address this scale mismatch and assess the vulnerability of historic landscapes to climate change. So first I'll discuss, I'll just give an overview of my study area and discuss the method, methodological framework that I've developed and explore how these results might be used to inform management. So my study area is in uh, North, Northwest Wales. It's the Dacini Valley, which is a designated landscape of special historic importance and is evidence of human habitation since the Mesolithic period, but has relatively little archeological research undertaken there. Much of the landscape is characterized by post-industrial and modern field systems along the flat valley floor which was subject to extensive draining in the 18th and 19th century and was previously marshland. The uplands also contain a wealth of prehistoric and medieval information, and the area has significant military remains that mainly date to the uh, First and Second World Wars. So the first step of my uh, framework is to develop a historic landscape characterization for the landscape in question in order to classify um, and group areas of similar historic character within the landscape. So I'll explain historic landscape characterization a bit more in a bit more detail. And the second step is to apply a vulnerability index to the landscape character areas. So whereas most vulnerability indices that are used in archaeology tend to have the archaeological site as the focal level, the vulnerability index that I've developed in this framework uses the historic landscape character areas as focal levels. So this can determine the vulnerability of the character of the, historic, of the historic landscape to climate change, rather than just the vulnerability of individual sites. Historic uh, landscape characterization is a method of mapping the historic landscape, and it de defines areas of similar historic character based on factors such as settlement pattern, field boundary morphology, field system age, agricultural type, and vegetation type. So it's used by Historic England and local authorities to improve their understanding of landscape evolution, revealing patterns and connections within a landscape, both spatially and through time, and the elements of historic land use that are still visible or in use today. It can also provide a framework for the recording and evaluation of the views and perceptions of people in the landscape, such as their experiences and memories. This diagram shows the very first historic landscape characterization that was carried out in um, Cornwall in 1993. It covers a much wider area than my study area, um, but the landscape character types I used are generally drawn from these. So this is the historic landscape characterization that I carried out for my study area. It indicated that the lowland areas of the valley floor, um, which stretch several kilometers inland, were mainly characterized as regular, so modern field systems and drained land systems indicating how extensive the drainage project during the 18th and 19th centuries was. Um, and you can kind of see it, the modern field systems kind of go all the way in line with seven or eight kilometers. So to carry, this, to carry out the historic landscape characterization, I used a range of sources such as historic and modern maps, um, current land use, aerial photographs, geophysical survey results, and historic environment record and national, national monuments record data. The purpose of this historic landscape characterization that I carried out was to facilitate a vulnerability assessment of the landscape in question. So as I mentioned previously, 
Most vulnerability indices use used in archaeology, especially in coastal areas, tend to focus on individual sites or collections of individual sites. So creating a historic landscape characterization generates a new spatial or physical focal level to which vulnerability assessments can be applied. So the vulnerability assessment that I um, developed has two stages. So the first stage assessed the vulnerability of characteristic features of each landscape character area to threats such as temperature and precipitation change, gullying erosion and desiccation. I undertook fieldwork to visit several characteristic features from each landscape character area to assess their vulnerability, such as pillboxes, fish traps, historic buildings, um, sheepfolds, hill, hill forts, and uh, living features such as woodlands and parks. Other variables that I included in the stage um, were the current level of preservation, the resistance of the remains, and the resistance of the local geology. Um, the second stage of the vulnerability, vulnerability index um, assess the vulnerability of each landscape character area as a whole. Um, this included the scores from stage one of the vulnerability index, as well as variables such as proximity to eroding shoreline, um, the percentage at risk of sea level rise, and um, coastal flooding and flu fluvial flooding, and the susceptibility of soil types in the um, area to erosion. So this is just an example of the way I use the the way I use GIS to calculate some of the variables. So here I use the flow accumulation tool to identify where uh, water accumulates as it flows across the landscape. So Louise mentioned earlier the um, impact on erosion that heavy precipitation events can um, can have. So this just so these darker blue areas just indicate the areas that water would flow as it flows across the landscape, and therefore the areas that are more at risk of um, gullying erosion. Um, I also calculated the susceptibility of the soil in the study area to erosion based on variables such as slope steepness, soil depth, grazing pressure, and the presence of vegetation. And finally, um, this, the dark areas on this map just show the areas that are at risk of at least a 1 in 100 year flooding event, although most of the dark area is actually at risk of a 1 in 33 year flooding event. Um, and evidence uh, suggests that sea level rise will cause the return period of flooding events to decrease. So this area is likely to become more at risk of flooding as climate change worsens. So these are the overall uh, results of the vulnerability index. And it indicates that based on the variables that I chose, um, the landscape character areas located on the coast and in low-lying areas uh, are the most vulnerable to projected impacts of climate change. Of course, if one were to use um, this framework which used different variables or focus on a different threat, then the results might look quite different. So this provides a holistic overview of the vulnerability of this historic landscape, and in this case it indicates that coastal processes are posing the biggest threat to archaeology and heritage. So to sum up, a landscape scale approach to heritage vulnerability with regards to climate change might help decision makers such as land managers, archaeological organisations and public bodies to have a more strategic approach to addressing the threat to the historic environment. So for instance, there might be a post-medieval mine at immediate risk of weathering or collapse or inundation. But in this study, the vulnerability score for the historic industry landscape character area um, was relatively low. In contrast, the focus of management can be trained upon managing the threat to the character of the historic landscape by focusing on landscape character areas that have higher vulnerability um, scores as a whole. So this is important when budgets for archaeological companies and public sector organisations often can't stretch to preserving all archaeological remains. It also helps the integration of archaeology with other landscape scale assessments. Um, so vulnerability and other assessments in disciplines such as ecology um, often and often use a similar method, so like a patch matrix approach across a landscape. It's much more easy to combine and compare findings and management approaches across disciplines when the results of their assessments fit the same spatial scale. 
So I think it's important to incorporate archaeology into climate change impact and adaptation assessments alongside social, economic and ecological systems that are often the focus of climate change and impact and adaptation reports. So another objective of my research um, in the future is to assess the sustainability of current and potential um, management approaches for both archaeology and coastal um, areas and look at the way that heritage could be included alongside economic, environmental and social considerations when um, coastal management policy and projects are developed. So archaeology and archaeological management has to fit into the way we address the social, economic and ecological impacts of climate change because these can be extensive and landscape-wide and are often given priority over heritage. Removing the focus from individual archaeological features and instead taking a landscape scale approach using historic environment, historic landscape characterization could be a successful way of doing that. Thank you very much.